If you came looking for Rich Strike, well, the 80 to 1 Kentucky Derby winner is not going to Baltimore this week. No Triple Crown this year, but instead the hype for Saturday's 147th Preakness Stakes at Pimlico will be built on a filly taking on the boys. Kentucky Oaks winner Secret Oath trying to join Swiss Skydiver to become the second filly in 19 months to win this race. With 86-year-old D. Wayne Lucas training her for what could be his record tying seventh Preakness victory. Secret Oath meeting the likes of Kentucky Derby runner-up Epicenter already a heavy futures favorite. Can a filly win the Preakness for the sixth time ever? We'll find out Saturday. This pop-up episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod, audio and video, the fifth annual Hardcore Handicappers get together to analyze the Preakness. We'll go in deep on all nine horses, and I'm guessing it won't take quite as long as it took for us to go through the 20 plus two in the Derby. But before the Derby is out of sight, out of mind, I want to remind our Horse Racing Nation handicappers what they said two weeks ago about Rich Strike. First, a man who said, if Rich Strike draws in, I like him a little more than Classic Causeway or Summer is Tomorrow. Guessing he likes him a little bit more, Ed DeRosa. What say you? I wish I had liked him a lot more. Uh, you know, I, I don't think he should have been the longest price on the board. Part of that was being an also eligible. I'm sure he was 100 plus to one going into Saturday. Um, stuff happens in racing. I'm still kind of shocked he won, but not shocked he clunked up. Live and learn, and we'll be back next year. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> not that many weeks away. What, about 50 and change. Next, she said, of all the horses I saw on the backside, Rich Strike really stood out to me as one of the most composed, really efficient stride. This big, hulking kind of a horse seems like he could run all day. You knew it all along, right, Sarah L. Bodwe? Wouldn't that be nice, right? Um, I, I did think that he made a, a nice physical impression, but once you're in the paddock with everybody that is feeling the buzz of the Kentucky Derby and seeing everybody together, it's not as easy to separate all of them because let's face it, this is the best of the three-year-old crop so far. They're all supposed to look good. So once that suicidal pace happened, a chaos ensued behind him and he got a great ride and showed up. So not that I placed any wagers on him, but I'm glad that at least I liked what I saw. Okay, well now here's someone who said if the pace gets hot, a lot of times it's the horse that clunks up for fourth that might be the 10th most talented horse in the race. No doubt, cashing on his Superfecta box, Mark Midland. I did play him in the Superfecta. I did not play him on top, so. Okay, so you cashed. I cashed, no. Oh. No, I don't box Superfectas. Ah, uh, all right, well. Yeah. I would say live and learn, but I think that's probably a strategy worth pursuing for uh, going forward, not just we trusting have pizza if he hit the super front. <laughs> yeah, I think I think uh, you'd know about that one. But uh, no, I, I, I used him in fourth. Uh, I'm trying to think if I used him in third a little bit, I think when I had some other horses keyed in fourth, but no higher than that. All right, no caviar pizza for us. Before we look ahead to Pimlico and go over each horse in the Preakness field, let me remind you of one other opinion from the Kentucky Derby. Let me read something to you you might have missed before the Derby and you wished you had read it beforehand. This came from our super screener. It said this, with rich strike drawn into the field, you should add this improving closer to any wagering strategies that reference long shots. That was not an after the race comment. This was in the pre-race Kentucky Derby edition of the super screener. And even if you bought it before rich strike drew in the day before the race, you would have received a special customers only email that added this notice this is no accident for years the super screener has shown you what's important and what's not when you're handicapping the biggest races every week and as i've said before the super screener uncovers live long shots you can use to boost payoffs up to 10 times up to 10 times mm -hmm. if you played before the derby and you took that advice you were getting more than that on red strike so why not jump in on this insight for the Preakness? Now, normally the Preakness edition of the Super Saver would cost you $99. But if you go right now to picks.horseracingnation.com, you'll find the Preakness edition of the Super Screener ready to go for you, marked down to only $39. That's right, a $99 value for only $39. So don't miss out on the next big value play. It could be coming up in this classic. Go to picks, 
P-I-C-K-S, picks.horseracingnation.com. Get the Preakness 147 edition of the Super Screener. Let's go to the Preakness, posted for 7.01 Eastern Time, Saturday at Pimlico in Baltimore. National Weather Service predicting mostly sunny, high of 89. Yeah, be in the short sleeves when we get to Baltimore. 30% chance of showers after 3 p.m., so call it odds on that the track will be fast for the Preakness. One and three sixteenths miles, two turns on the main track, eight Colts in a Philly, $1.65 million. And as we always do, we'll go from the rail out. And we start with number one, Simplification. Sired by Not This Time, trained by Antonio Sano. This time the jockey replacing Jose Ortiz is the Hall of Famer, Johnny Velasquez, who is 0 for 11 in the Preakness. He's had three seconds in the race. The Fountain of Youth winner, Simplification, finished third in the Derby, normally a pace chaser, but he was as far back as 15th before closing to finish fourth at 35 to one in the Derby. Not getting 35 to one on him now. Morning line, six to one, as we were recording on Tuesday morning in Las Vegas, Circa, the only book up with futures at eight to one. Mark, start with you with Simplification. Yeah, you know, he's a nice horse. Um... I don't think he's competitive to win here. And uh, I think when you take the Derby in perspective, it was a su suicidal pace, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the last, I think, five horses that were in the, the five back in the race, three of them filled out the top five slots. And so, you know, while he ran a nice race, um, I think what he, he did what you're supposed to do when you're sitting, you know, in 15th or 16th way back. Uh, Mo Donegal uh, had a little tougher trip than him, finished fifth, Simplication finished fourth, Happy Jack was back there and made a big, started to make a big move and got, had nowhere to go. Um, I, I think this is one of my opinions in this race here is there's a lot of people that are going to be really gaga over Simplification as a horse that can turn the tables. And I, I would say if you took that horse, just like we saw with Rich Strike, if you took um, any of the other 19 horses and put them in the back with simplification, Mo Donegal and Rich Strike, they would run third or fourth. So I, I don't think I would just really caution. I'm just staring at that six to one saying, wow, that's just really bad value here. So um, I don't think he's good enough to contend with the top three on, on his best day. Uh, so my opinion is going to be uh, keep him out of the exacta, hope that he's out of the trifecta, maybe even hope that he's out of the superfecta and create some value by essentially, you know, playing him a little defensively and hoping that this horse doesn't hit the board. Sarah? I think that the decision that was made in the Derby to take this horse back, mm -hmm. one that we've seen show early speed or set the pace or end up in a stalking position, they made an executive decision to take the horse back and use that sort of running style for him in the Derby. And in the Derby, that was the right decision. Now going into the Preakness, we're not seeing the same sort of pace set up. So I wonder what the decision is, especially from the rail with him. Are they going to have him sit a more tactically closer trip and in a stalking position? I don't really see them sending him. I think that there's enough pace ahead of him that that would be an unwise decision. But I think the jockey change to Johnny Velasquez, a rider that really wants to be up close or at least put his horses in contention early may be telling that he sits a lot closer than he did in the Derby. Mm. And if he sits closer and makes that run into a pace, if there's more of one on than we expect, or if he ends up um, showing that he's a slightly better horse than we kind of think that he is or give him credit for, I agree with the morning line that he's likely the fourth best horse in the field. But I also agree with Mark that six to one isn't a price that you want to find out on. Ed? Yeah, I agree uh, with Mark a lot here. I actually thought it might be an opportunity to bet simplification a week ago when I was doing the line for HRN and Rich Strike was still targeting the race. I naively, I suppose, thought he might be 12 or 15 to one. I, I mean, he just took no money in the Derby. Uh, he was five to two in the Fountain of Youth, between two and two to one and five to two in the Florida Derby. And then people abandoned ship. And you know, like Mark said, he ran the race. You'd expect him to run given the, the dynamics, but he did run that race and he's super consistent, mid 90 to upper 90 first net speed ratings throughout his career. He's never really had that breakthrough race though. 
And I was excited that maybe at 12 to one uh, to bet him to have that breakthrough race. But now Rich strikes out. He's fourth choice on the morning line. Six to one is an absolute complete fade for me. Yeah, and I'll tell you one other thing about simplification. And I liked him for the Derby. And if not for that horse on the rail late, I had the trifecta throw out the last 10 strides I'm cashing. And I liked simplification. Part of the reason was their strategy coming out of the Fountain of Youth. Save some horse from the Florida <laughs> Derby for the Kentucky Derby. Coming back in two weeks isn't exactly saving horse. I smell bounce here. And so I, I'm going to completely fade simplification this time around from number one. Number two, here's a new shooter. There are six of them in this race. And this is Creative Minister. Talk about a gamble, $150,000 supplement to come into this race. Of course, that money paid by the ownership group led by Paul Fireman, who made his billions distributing Reebok. This is a horse by Creative Cause, trained by Kenny McPeak, who won the, uh, the 2020 Preakness with uh, Swiss Skydiver. The jockey, Brian Hernandez Jr. This horse has raced three times, broke his maiden in April in the slop at Keeneland going two turns, another two-turn race to win an allowance on the Derby undercard. So two weeks back for him, a mid-pack horse who is out of a tap at mare. 10 to 1 on the morning line in Las Vegas at Circa, nearly 15 to 1. Sarah? I think that he's interesting as a horse that you might want to use underneath, but I also think that I want to see if he's really good enough to compete with stakes caliber before I use him in a top win or second place sort of candidacy in my wagers. In his allowance win on the Derby Day undercard, he got an absolutely perfect trip. He saved ground on the rail. He got the perfect switch out at the top of the stretch to get clear running room on the outside. This was actually Ken McPeak's 500th win at Churchill Downs, which was announced by Travis Stone in the call. Seems like a nice allowance horse going forward. He can probably sp step up in his career to space stakes company, no matter what sort of outcome they have in here later on through the three-year-old season but I don't really see him as a win candidate in here. I'd want to see something more from him. One other factor I should mention too, Ed, he's coming off Lasix to come into this race. Uh, always uh, another variable in the handicap. I think in his case with the price, uh, it's less of a concern. Usually the, the lower the price, the more you just would want to worry about things like that. Uh, he got a 101 Grisnet speed rating for that allowance win. I uh, kind of agree with Sarah, but a bit dressed up maybe just with uh, the perfect trip, two weeks rest. He started his career in March, uh, so we're talking about two and a half months, only fourth career start, stretching out in the Preakness, uh, kind of a, a mini Taba uh, in that regard, um, although just kind of with the progression and not being thrown into grade one company. Second time out, a little different, you know, another one of those situations where if this were a stouter field and we were getting 20 to one on a horse who ran a 101 last out, I'd be a little more excited, but it's even at 10 times the price of Epicenter, it's tough to get excited about choosing creative minister over a horse like that. So I do like him better than simplification and a little bit higher the price, but overall not going to be in, in the win slot for me. Mark, basically a three to one bet here if you're the owner is $150,000 to pick up the $600,000 plus first prize for creative minister. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with everyone else that, uh, you know, he, he's kind of dressed up off of uh, an easier uh, trip last time inside. Um, he's had a lot of racing in a short time. Um, the odds aren't great here. You know, I think people are, are going to be looking for that uh, new shooter or, uh, you know, who can turn the tables and, you know, he's he's nearly undefeated. So I think some people may go in this direction. I, I think the morning line of 10 to 1 is, isn't a bad one, but the, you know, the odds you're getting just aren't there, uh, especially for him to turn the tables on on the Philly and, and early voting and, you know, and uh, epicenter. So, uh I don't really have much interest in this horse. So again, I, I use him defensively in, in third a little bit or fourth, but not in the top two. I'm a little higher on him than the three of you, but I wouldn't be playing him to win. I would look for him maybe to hit the board. One other note, a variable too, he'll carry 126 pounds. He carried no more than 122 in any of his first three races. And here comes- Real yes. quick, mm -hmm. I, sure. I want to do the, I'm going to do the research, but just thinking about it, I have to think that, it's pretty rare a horse wins 
a classic race without having run at nine furlongs or beyond yet. Mm. Um, and I was spot checking. It certainly hasn't happened at least since uh, 2014. And uh, not my mental faculties aren't quite that I can go further than that without looking it up. But that, that's against them too. Okay, now stay tuned and may have the answer before the end of this podcast, or maybe in a coming episode of the RFRP. We'll send people to the website. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very, they, hey, that's fantastic. That's what you yeah. call a cross promotion. Here is what could be the rich strike of the Preakness. Who's going to be the longest shot on the board? Who was the last horse in? It is number three, Fenwick. This entry was announced only a few hours before Monday's draw. He is one for six. He's finished last more than he's finished first. Three last, <laughs> one win on five tracks for three trainers. He's by Curlin, who won this race back in 2007. Kevin McCathens, the trainer. More on him in a moment. The jockey, Florent Giroux, who replaces Paco Lopez in terms of the ride on this horse. Upgrade here, but 0 for 5 in the Preakness. This was a horse who was with David Fisher when he broke his maiden on his fifth try, and then he beat odds on favorite command performance in that race at Tampa Bay Downs. Sarah and I were re-watching this race just the other day. Before that, was second on debut at Belmont Park, trying to, as a matter of fact, finishing out of the money, though, in his next three for Steve Asmussen. So it goes from Asmussen to Fisher, now to McCathen. 50 to 1 on the morning line. Circa in Las Vegas has him posted at nearly... 36 to 1. Ed, we'll start with you with Fenwick. Uh, 36 to 1. Uh, I mean, I guess they took some action on him or just don't want to get burnt after the Derby. I hope people bet it the same way paramutually. Uh, this is a complete takeout reducer with any dollar he wagers. And, uh, you know, I, I can hear everyone now, oh, you said the same thing about Rich Strike. <laughs> right. I mean, the, <laughs> They do win occasionally. Uh, it's very rare. Rich Strike was actually the first longest shot on the board in a field of 12 or more to win this year. Uh, it's, it's extremely rare that the longest shots on the board in bigger fields actually win. Uh, long shots win, but Rich Strike was the first this year. That's incredible to me. So uh, I think there's going to be some recency bias. I actually think I agree that this horse should be 50 to one. I'm not so sure that he's not going to be 30 or 40 to one. We've seen this before play yeah. out in the Preakness. There just aren't big long shots. Mm -hmm. Any dollar he takes is a dollar toward making me more money on hopefully having the winning combination. I give this horse zero chance. Mm. 23 to one, the longest shot ever to win the Preakness to amplify what you're saying about prices. Mark? Yeah, Ed said it well. This horse is just a total toss. And I uh, just want to preview at the end. I've got, to, you know, everybody's trying to say, how do you make money in this race? There's only nine horses. I've got a super effective smash that you can smash hit several times. Won't cost much at all. Part of the reason is it's a not a nine horse race. We'll take Fenwick <laughs> out. It's only an eight horse race. Okay. All right. Fenwick. Hardcore smash. Hardcore smash. Sarah? I fully agree that he's not an eligible win candidate, at least to me and uh, my colleagues here. But I think that you have to at least think about him from a pace standpoint in this race. He is the most inside speed. When he did win over command performance, I think that was much more a function of command performance not showing up than him really being the best horse in the race. But he was allowed to cruise on the front end and he wasn't allowed to do that in the bluegrass stakes where he finished 11th, which is obviously a disappointing effort coming into a stakes race facing tougher company. The connections have made it clear that they want him to go ahead and flaunt his speed. Well, we know early voting is going to do the same thing and Armagnac is likely to do that as well. So maybe the pace heats up more so than we thought it was going to with the late edition of him just the morning before the draw. I don't see him as good enough to win this race, but I think he at least needs to be considered as affecting the outcome, much like Summer is Tomorrow did. In case you're wondering, longest shot ever to win the Preakness, Master Derby at 23 to 1 in 1975. And I promised you a little bit more detail on Kevin McCathen. He trained 33 years ago, got out of the business, started his own training center with his late brother, now his late brother. Florida Training Center, among the horses they broke and got going on the way to their careers, American Pharaoh. And now he's back to training for the first time 
in a third of a century. Number four is perhaps the buzz horse for the public. Will she be the buzz horse for serious hardcore handicappers? About to find out with secret oath, she will have the five pound weight break because she is a filly, 121 pounds rather than the 126 for the eight Colts. She's by Arrowgate, trained by the great D. Wayne Lucas, last won the Preakness in 2013 with Oxbow. That gave him his sixth win in this race. Jockey Luis Saez retains the ride, looking for his first in this race. Here's a horse who's won four of five since New Year's Eve. Only loss was the third place finish to the boys in the Arkansas Derby. Won the Kentucky Oaks by two lengths. A closer who once came from seven lengths behind in a race to win by eight and a quarter. Granted, it was just an allowance race at Oaklawn back in December. Nevertheless, certainly eye-catching. Nine to two on the morning line, four to one co-second choice at Circa but third choice right now on the morning line. Mark? Uh, this is my second choice here. Uh, I give her you know, a, a fighting chance to beat Epicenter, uh, maybe some things that have to go her way or are against Epicenter. Um, you know, she ran a dynamite race in the Oaks. Uh, Luis Saez rode a great race. She went wide, you know, extremely wide. Um, so I think that's something to factor into her speed figure that you would probably want to bump it up a few points. And uh, I give her a shot. So, you know, in terms of, uh, again, the exotics, I'm going to use her on top, probably uh, just with the, with the age, so just 4-8 on top. Sarah? She certainly deserves to be here. She's uh, made a qualifying case that she's likely the best three-year-old filly right now, especially with that very impressive win in the Kentucky Oaks. I think that a concern that you do have to take into consideration is that while she finished third with a terrible trip in the Arkansas Derby, the horses that did beat her in there, they were absolute no-shows in the Derby. Even with that suicidal pace, Cyberknife was kind of nowhere. Barber Road showed up for, what, I think six in there. So I would wonder a little bit about the quality that she's faced in terms of males when she's faced them. I think that she's the best filly to kind of take on this assignment going into face the boys in the Preakness. And, she certainly has a shot to do so, but I don't know that she's better than Epicenter. Maybe she gets a better trip than him, or maybe she surprises me a little bit and shows that she is. But I don't know that she, on his best day, with both of them getting equally good trips, can beat him. But she beat Kathleen O. Uh, oh, man. Oh, okay. I don't think Kathleen O is better than Epicenter, though. No, I know. I'm teasing. <laughs> Listen to that, that rakish wit from the boss, Ed. I didn't tease you about Smile Happy. <laughs> he was not my top pick there, um, but... Uh, okay, you talked about him a lot. <laughs> until, until they said they were going to the lead, so that's when, that's when uh, I kind of got off that train. Yeah, that was, that was an odd... Uh... Move, yeah. All yours, Ed. I don't know how I can top that. Uh, <laughs> I, I do love uh, her move. I mean, it's electrifying to watch that whether the Arkansas Derby where she ultimately flattened out or the Kentucky Oaks, which ended up being the winning move. Uh, she, she brings the show and with the way the pace seems to be setting up here in the Preakness, I, I think we're in for more of the same because we know early voting. Uh, certainly that's his way to win. And then you have Armagnac and Fenwick uh with him perhaps and then epicenter does he move with secret oath is he her target does he sit behind her uh she really uh, makes for interesting dynamics of the race i do kind of agree with sarah and lead more toward the arkansas derby is going to be more indicative of what we see here especially at the shortest price i i think she'll be the second choice i was surprised to see early voting made the second choice uh we'll see how that shakes out at nine to two She's somewhat interesting. I, I think she'll be less than that. So I am looking to fade, uh, just thinking she'll flatten out. Uh, certainly third or fourth uh, is, is possible because that's the kind of run she has, but uh, I'm gonna leave her out of the top two. Can I ask you, uh, the three of you, I haven't heard a lot about the ride she got in the Arkansas Derby, which was pretty heavily criticized. Thus the jockey changed to Saez. Do you look at that as an excuse? Well, I think the race was an excuse. I think she, you know, she got the, uh, what happened in the Derby, right? She moved, made a suicidal move into that pace. So for me, the Arkansas Derby is just, 
sort of a toss. It's hard to get a, a good. I personally on. have an issue. Like it's fine. She didn't win cyber knife. It was his day, whatever. But I definitely have an issue with her not getting second over Barbara road. I mean, at the 16th pole, it didn't even look like it'd be close. And she just completely flattened out. And it was because of that. I didn't like her in the Oak. So uh, she's already kind of shown me that maybe I should have looked at it through a different lens, but now we're at the Preakness back against males, two weeks rest. Uh, if she couldn't dig in and out finish him for second, I just have a hard time seeing how she wins this. Sarah, do you agree? I think that we're all a little quick to criticize the rider because he is one of the lesser known, lesser experienced jockeys. But even the top jockeys that we all really like and follow, we all see them make mistakes and we kind of pass because we see them do great things as well. So obviously most would agree that Luis Saez is a much more experienced, much more um, better, Season, yeah. better, yeah, that's the word, uh, jockey than she had Louis, before. Yeah, Luis Contreras, Contreras. by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it was a difference maker. I don't know that we'll ever know that, but I get why people think that it was. I think one of the issues with a ride like that is, I mean, he rode to win. He made what I'm sure he thought at the time could be a winning move and it didn't work out. If he had sat back there and said, well, I'll ride for second after Cyberknife makes his move, there's no doubt in my mind that she's second in that race, but he rode to win and it didn't work out. Um, you know, that, that was the hand he was dealt if they were going to go for a win based on where she was early. So, uh, you know, Sarah's bringing sage advice to, to jockey criticism and, you know, I'm never going to complain about a guy going for the win after, you know, a misstep early, but if he had it back, you know, maybe he just says, well, I'll ride her for a second, but that's racing. Jockey change in 2009 did come into play when Rachel Alexandra was the last Kentucky Oaks winner to come to the Preakness and then win it. She had won the Oaks by 20 and a quarter, got sold. And then Calvin Burrell hops on board after having ridden Mind That Bird in the Derby. And then it was Rachel who beat Mind That Bird by a length in the Preakness. Mind That Bird never winning another race again. Onward to early voting, number five. He's by Gunrunner. He's trained by Chad Brown, who won the Preakness five years ago with cloud computing. Jose Ortiz gets the ride here. This is why he's not on simplification. He has first call with Chad. Oh, for four in the Preakness. In fact, Jose's never been in the money in the Preakness. This could be an early pace setter, never worse than a neck behind at any call in his brief career. This will be just his fourth start. First time away from Aqueduct, Won his debut in December, then won the Withers in the Mud in February. Finished second by a neck to Mo Donegal in the Wood. Questions about his distance led for one reason, not to go to the Derby. For another, Chad decided to train up six weeks to the Preakness with early voting. Seven to two on the morning line, four to one at Circa. Sarah? Well, I think you have to take into consideration that they have specifically pointed for this race. They had the points to go into the Derby and they chose not to. And I think part of Chad's reasoning for that was that this horse has not really been battle tested like Zandon, his other contender was. He's gotten to go to the front, not have any kickback in his face, not face a, a larger field like Zandon had and having to weave through traffic and overcome all sorts of trouble. Early voting hasn't had to do that yet. So we don't know if he can. And the addition of other speed late into this game, I think at least has to concern them a little bit about what their plan is with early voting. He might just be faster early and might be able to take pace pressure. But at seven to two, do you really want to find out what he's made of at second choice or third choice in the wagering? Whereas Epicenter, while six to five is not anything anybody wants on a horse that makes the most sense in here, he's had to face much more trouble. He's had to sit close to a hot pace and then finish on in the Derby only to be out finished by Rich Strike. He's dealt with the crowds and having to rate and other things like that, that early voting just hasn't had to contend with yet. So he's a top contender for sure. And Chad Brown has won this race before with Clarevish with cloud computing. I think that it's great that they chose to wait and do what they felt was best for him and give him his best opportunity to win in here. But does this race set up for him? It doesn't now as well as it was going to before. Klarovich is personified by Seth Clareman. 
who is Chad Brown's top client, and he paid $200,000 for this Colt, who is out of a Tisnow mare. Ed? Yeah, kind of a bargain in retrospect with as well as Gunrunner has done. Uh, this certainly uh, on his way to being a stallion with a great at stakes win mm. in the Withers, runner up in the wood. Uh, I was hoping this horse would be third choice. I'm still holding on to that hope. If he's a $10 horse, that's where the value is for me. Uh, four to one or better. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think he can wire this field 20% of the time, which is what four to one is. So that's, you know, I'm not overthinking it in that regard. And I kind of like him is one of the keys as well. Cause I think even if Armagnac and Fenwick rough him up early, I expect early voting to stick around and I see him as more likely in the super than secret oath, but it all comes down to price for me. If, you know, we're looking at the black eyed Susan double will pays and early voting to clear second choice. And it's going to be five to two. I'm going to have to go back to the drawing board, but at four to one or better, he's my pick. Mark. Yeah. Um, I thought Sarah said it well, um, in terms of price versus epicenter and, uh, you know, we were we were outside Chad Brown's uh, barn before the Derby when he talked about not running uh, early voting and, and uh, he was pointing to this race, but he also was talking a lot about the inexperience of early voting had not taken dirt, um, had not run this far, had not run that, that much pressure. Um, like Sarah said, it, it's kind of a poor, poor odds if he's going to take pressure from these other two. I think the, uh, the late entries kind of really hurt his chances here. Um, if we look at, you know, Epicenter and Rosario, you know, I thought wrote, wrote a masterful ride in the Derby, sitting way back off that pace. Uh, I think Rosario's got one goal here. Just keep an eye on early voting, sit two, three links off him and watch and make his move and take him whenever he wants. And, and I think Epicenter's got the additional conditioning. Uh, so early voting hasn't raced in six weeks. Epicenter's coming back from a mile and a quarter. Uh, to, you know, in two weeks, the Derby horses coming in the Preakness um, have performed very, very well. So I think there's just so much advantage to Epicenter um, and the additional pace. That, so that's why, um, for me, Secret Oath is, is sort of a little bit of a wild card that uh, I would consider to, to win. I wouldn't consider early voting to win uh, because he can get clear, because he's a good horse. He's definitely used in second in the exacta. Uh, I did want to note, too, he's a gun runner. Uh, I still, you know, there's not a lot of data on the gun runners going really far. The two gun runners in the Derby were Taba and Cyberknife. Uh, didn't run great, but that's still not a lot of data. Hmm. And uh, I'll tell you what, you, you take a look at the walk up that early voting has had to this point. I keep coming back to the fact he's only raced at Aqueduct. And to me, Aqueduct is the NIT for the Triple Crown. I'm completely <laughs> fading early voting for that reason. Shame on me if he hits the board, but that's now what I'm it, doing. It has been okay with the Derby skippers in the Preakness, though. Red Bullet, mm -hmm. Bernardini, mm -hmm. Cloud Computing, mm -hmm. and now early voting. I'll, I'll I've take my chance. i myself into taking seven to two. Okay. All right. You and I should have a side bet, but I already, I, I'm already in deep <laughs> tea with dead on side bets. Oh, my God, isn't that the truth? <laughs> and Ed's lunches, I got to tell you. Hey, listen, before we completely take leave of lessons we should have learned on the Kentucky Derby and before we get to the second half of the Preakness field and maybe to some undercard plays, let me flash back nearly two weeks for a moment. Did you read what was written about Rich Strike before he won the Derby? And I'm here saying nothing was written about Rich Strike before he won the Derby. <laughs> Not so. If you got the super screener, you would have had some knowledge that you could have put into betting action. This is what Mike Shutty wrote in the super screener about Rich Strike before the Derby. His form is progressing. He has plenty of foundation, is bred to go long. That late pace number of 107, the Jeff Ruby, and his 95 Briz speed rating propelled him to the best of the long shots list. If he draws in, Sonny Leone will gradually take him over to the rail to save ground hoping some space opens up for his last charge from the top of the stretch. It was as if Shuddy had a crystal ball and could see the whole thing <laughs> happening right before him. So, and this, this he wrote before, before Rich Strike drew in. So if you bought the super screener, you knew what was cooking in post 20. So what about the Preakness? Find out right now, go to picks.horseracingnation.com. 
check out the Preakness edition of the Super Screener, normally $99. But if you go right now and check it out, it will cost you only $39. Put it in the basket and go ahead and get it. Already we're talking about value then. 16% off this proprietary handicapping knowledge that paid off big if you used it the right way in the Kentucky Derby. $99 value, just $39 for the Preakness edition of the Super Screener, available right now at picks.horseracingnation.com. P-I-C-K-S dot horseracingnation.com. This is the Hardcore Handicappers edition of the Ron Platter Racing Pod. We do this four times a year for the Kentucky Derby, the Belmont Stakes, the Breeders' Cup. Oh, yes. And of course, this Saturday for the Preakness. And it's yours right now as we're also going to examine what's on the undercard. Run. Let's see if we have anything uh, to go there. Yes, Mark. Run, I just wanted to add that, uh, you know, one of the reasons that uh, Mike was able to come up with Rich Strike as a top long shot for the Derby, and he's got two top long shots for the Preakness, is he has a separate score of uh, scoring the long shot. So going back 20 years in, in all these races, it's different for each race. And uh, Rich Strike was uh, the second best long shot in the Derby. And I think a lot of it came to the fact that he was, like you said, he was closer, he had breeding, and uh, there weren't that many closers in the race. So he checked a lot of boxes. And uh, funny story, but uh, my daughter in high school, she said uh, her friend, friend's dad wanted tips so i forwarded her the super screener she forwarded to her friend who forwarded to her dad he read it start to finish and he hit the trifecta for seventy five hundred dollars so now now he's asking me for freakness tips you should be asking him for something in return if you know what i'm saying <laughs> lunch <laughs> get that deck, open. yeah get that caviar pizza we were talking about earlier there you go on the undercard let's take a look and see what we have in terms of tips for saturday at pimlico before or maybe even after the preakness ed let me start with you yeah i know uh people like to kind of spoof the uh, arabian race but one thing of note at pimlico uh, which we'll dig in more with our track trends tools at horse racing nation but uh eight and a half furlong races very kind to the front end and i've definitely found in arabian races uh, you want to be on the front end as well, very similar to Greyhound in that regard. So uh, there is a, uh, to me, a potential for lone speed in the Arabian race. Hopefully I won't be looking to get out. I'll be just looking to parlay my winnings on early voting, but high maintenance number four uh, in the UAE Cup uh, to close out the Preakness card, I think uh, definitely has an early speed advantage, uh, is actually one of the younger horses, relatively speaking, in this group. And uh, there's no morning line yet, so I, I can't be too excited about high maintenance. Maybe everyone else will see what I do. Uh, but I'm definitely going to be playing doubles into the four uh, to make my Preakness weekend explode. The number four in the getaway, high maintenance, high with three H's, by the way, for yes. Ed on the undercard at the uh, Preakness. Mark, what about you? Um, I thought of, on the Preakness card, the ninth race, the uh, Chick Lang was really interesting. Um, a lot of speed in there. Uh, there's a lot of horses uh, that are, you know, gonna go to the front and fight it out. And uh, a couple that I was in interested in is Old Homestead that wired at Keeneland. Um, he wired at Delta Downs. He, you know, went into Keeneland at nine to one. and. Uh, and wired there and uh i think he could be uh something that you can tend to but also uh chasing time so steve asmussen has this one uh he's routed the last two in the rebel and the arkansas derby uh, actually about last three cutting the allowance but now he's turning back uh may have kind of the best closing kick in the race and i think uh, I, I, I you know it's hard to say without the morning line but i think uh he's an interesting one in there so the five and the six i'm looking at in race nine I like you're looking at an undefeated horse. You're looking at one for Asmus and cutting back. So there's a lot of interest to be had in this uh, Chick Lang sprint. Sarah, what about you on the undercard? <clears throat> so looking at the race right before the Preakness, that's the turf sprint going off his race 12, a horse that I really like that has, I think they figured out exactly what, what he wants to do, which is go exactly five furlongs turf sprinting, not five and a half, not six, exactly five. That's Karateri, the number two horse. The half sibling actually just debuted at Belmont Park at a decent price. That was the number 10, Kinesi, and that was actually going long on the turf. So some uh, diversion in routing versus sprinting, but shows that there's a significant pedigree for this horse as well going forward. Not that we needed to know that because he's been extremely 
relatively successful so far. He actually holds the five furlong course record at Saratoga. So going this five furlong distance of the turf sprint, I would rely on him very heavily in a turf sprint to the Preakness double. Won the Janus last time out, but last time out was New Year's Eve at Gulfstream Park going five furlongs on the turf, referring to the number two horse Karatari in the 12th on the Preakness undercard. Back to the Preakness itself, and we resume with a horse putting blinkers on. Actually, I'm going to guess somebody will put the blinkers on him. If Happy Jack could do that himself, that would be a story. He is by Oxbow. Wayne Lucas is his 2013 Preakness winner, but he's trained by Doug O'Neill, who won the Preakness with Al Have Another in 2012. Tyler Gaffalione, oh, is he red hot lately? He uh, won his only Preakness start in 2019 with War of Will, so he replaces Rafael Bejarano, Doug trying to play the hot hand, or hands, if you will, here. Happy Jack, a closer who was 14th in the Derby, largely ran his race before it started, got his tail caught in the gate. They had to reload him, and so he was pretty well spent getting a little uh, fractious over that. He was 23 to 1 in that race with no blinkers. Uh, he's only been shorter than 23 to 1 once. On the Santa Anita Trail toward the Derby for Brad Kelly and Calumet, who've uh, you know won everything forever, at least by name, if only by the stable. He was fifth in the Bob Lewis with blinkers, third in the San Felipe with no blinkers, third in the Santa Anita Derby with blinkers, and now uh, is going to go to uh, blinkers again after having them off in the Derby. His only win was his January debut at six furlongs, and that was with blinkers, and his only time with LASIK, so he's been off it since. 30 to 1 on the morning line, 25 to 1 at Circa. Mark, with all that information, what do you think of Happy Jack? That's interesting about the blinkers on and off. Um, I think he's, you know, one of the, the best closers in the race. There's not, um, it's a short field. There's not a lot uh, in here. Uh, you've got to look for long shots, and I think this is one of them. Uh, I went back and watched the Derby replays, and uh, not, you know, I couldn't really see it from his, his trouble from the NBC feed or the Churchill Downs feed, but the NBC overhead feed, you can see that when he starts to make his run, I think he's moving just as well as Modonagal and Simplification, and even could have had more horse. He, he was starting from a little further back, and uh, he was. The jock moved towards the rail and he ran right into summers tomorrow and, and essentially lost everything right there um so at 30 to 1 i think this is a horse uh to get your price uh and now the question is how to play it and where to get your price uh, my lean is going to be in the superfecta and and to key this horse maybe with one other long shot in the bottom of the superfecta uh could he run third sure maybe um but uh, when you're keying 30 to ones, that's where you can get a nice pep price and, and really blow things up. So to me, this is one of the values to play in the race. As you were saying all that, I was thinking, wow, this makes sense, this makes sense. And as you're saying it, I thought, okay, bottom of the super. And so I don't know if it's good news or bad news for you that we're agreeing on this now. Sarah? <laughs> well, unfortunately for you both, I do agree with that sentiment as well. I think he definitely belongs in a superfecta or maybe even a trifecta conversation they're making significant changes for him and i think that that demonstrates that a they see something in him that shows them that they they think he belongs in this kind of caliber of company and i also wonder if they want him to sit a little bit closer with putting those blinkers back on another thing that i want to talk about too is the price discrepancy between happy jack who's 30 to 1 on the morning line and armagnac who is 12 to 1 on the morning line <laughs> Right. Happy Jack has run better than Armagnac the times that they have faced each other. So the fact that he is such a bigger price than a horse that he's already defeated out in California, I know a lot of that has to do with the fact that Armagnac came back to run in that allowance race, but Happy Jack seems like the one that you want to wager on over him, at least in terms of a price discrepancy and what they've done when they have faced each other. Can't remember if I mentioned a 30 to 1 morning line, circa 25 to 1. Ed? Uh, yeah, I would say I mostly agree. Um, I, I might get a little more ambitious, uh, higher up the ladder just because that Santa Anita Derby did get a 97 first net speed rating, which you will need to improve on. And the Derby, you know, basically if you're saying, well, we can draw a line through it, you get Tyler, Doug O'Neill's coming back on two weeks. Uh, you know, he's, he's done it before, but he's also not done it before. So it's not like he feels like he has to be here and getting Tyler certainly a vote of confidence in my mind. So, so yeah, he's an interesting player to me to, to spice things up with 
one of the obvious ones. Uh, what's interesting about Happy Jack, when I watched the Derby live, is there was definitely, and I've seen chatter on social media as well, where people have said the same. There was a time that people thought he was the one closing up the rail because they saw the two, and it ended up being <clears throat> 21 rich strike. So some backers of Happy Jack were very happy uh, for a, a split second in the Derby. I can't believe it was only 23 to one. I mean, you look at the prices, horses. I mean, he should have been probably twice that and wasn't. Hopefully he's 30 to one here. I, I agree with my colleagues that he's he's in the mix underneath. A horse that came into the mix late in the going, at least in terms of when we were hearing he would come into the Preakness, is number seven, Armagnac, sired by Quality Road, trained by Tim Yak Teen, replacing Bob Baffert. Chucky Irod Ortiz Jr. He's 0 for 3 in the Preakness. He did finish second last year with the late Midnight Bourbon. Irod comes in to replace Drayden Van Dyke for this ride. This is a $210,000 Colt who's owned by the same folks who own Messier, who finished 15th in the Kentucky Derby. That would be Tom Ryan and company with SF Racing and Saul Human with Mataket. He led from gate to wire with blinkers off to win a one and one sixteenth mile hundred thousand dollar allowance at Santa Anita just 13 days before the Preakness. So he has the shortest amount of time off since his last race. Tugged early, distant fourth in the Santa Anita Derby, finishing behind two stable mates, Taba and Messier, as well as Happy Jack. He remains without blinkers for the second time in a row. He's one for one without and one for four with. This one may be coincidental or not. You tell me. Off Lasix now. 0 for 4 without Lasix. 2 for 2 with. 12 to 1 on the morning line. 18 to 1 at Circa. Sarah? A lot of people are saying that his last effort was extremely impressive and very eye-catching and opening. And I watched the race and sure, he led from gate to wire. And a lot of horses at Santa Anita, we do see them go gate to wire and speed it plays critically in all tracks and all races, but especially in California, I just don't think he's good enough or as good as people think that he is. Uh, whenever he's faced stakes company, the mention of Lasix is important, of course, but whenever he's faced higher level company, he hasn't really done anything to show that he belongs in this field. I think that you have to consider him from a pace presence standpoint, uh, that he draws kind of inside of Epicenter, I think is to Epicenter's advantage, Epicenter being in post eight, getting to see what everybody does inside of him and where he wants to be in this race. But like I said, with the Happy Jack, the price discrepancy to me is kind of silly. And I think it just shows that everybody's really wowed by the last allowance race or perhaps the connections of this course, but he can beat me. I don't really see it with him. Yeah, Ed, interesting point that Sarah makes the Lasix, no Lasix thing maybe more about the company he was keeping and not the company he was keeping, right? Uh, perhaps, uh, but looking at the speed ratings, uh, two of those non-LASIX efforts were in the 70s and two of the LASIX efforts were in the 90s. Mm, okay. That's first net. But he's not for me. And I think the Happy Jack discrepancy is mostly the reason why. 30 to one on a horse who's run with them or 12 to one when you know that there's gonna be other pace. So it's not even the fact that, okay, Happy Jack showing he belongs with Armagnac and is twice the price. Then you throw in the wrinkle of, well, Armagnac's gonna to have to run with early voting and the Lasix thing. It's a lot at 12 to one to take. So I'm not gonna take it. And he's one, you know, to me, Mark talked about the uh, Superfecta smash and it's not a nine horse race. This is one of those in my mind that I'd be willing to eliminate completely. Uh, I just don't, I, I should say, I foresee a scenario where he doesn't even hit the superfecta based on how the race is run. And looking at the early uh, pace ratings uh, on the Bristnet PPs, Happy Jack is actually as fast as Fenwick early. So with the blinkers on and kind of what we talked about, maybe a little closer in this race than what we saw in the Derby, He's really interesting to me versus, you know, Fenwick and Armagnac back through it. So uh, this is a pass. Mark? Yeah, Ed, you read my mind. This is another toss. So now it takes it down to a seven horse field in terms of, uh, yeah, really hitting that super effective. Um, I think, I think Ed and Sarah said it well. I mean, 12 to one um, you know, compared to Happy Jack, that's just a bad price. I mean, maybe this horse is 18 to one, but still just don't really see him 
uh, I think early voting is going to have a measured epicenter is going to be behind them. So uh, this is a total toss for me. From, oh, but before I leave Armagnac, in case you're wondering, it is a slow sipping cordial, which would be a good garnish, I told Ed. And Ed looked at me, he thought, well, Sherry? And I said, no, Armagnac. And he looked at me and said, oh, well, see, that's why you're the older brother. Huh. You heard that somewhere before? If you think you know that, you know where to find me on Twitter. All right, number eight, here's the favorite, and he is Epicenter. Sired by not this time, trained by Steve Asmussen, who's won the Preakness twice with Curlin in 07 and with Rachel Alexandra in 09. Joel Rosario, 0 for 7 in the Preakness, but he's had three seconds. Here's a horse who can pace the race. He can stalk it. He stayed back in eighth early on the way to leading the Kentucky Derby until 10 strides from the end. Finished second. He won the Risen Star leading from gate to wire, won the Louisiana Derby rating the pace. He's been favored in his last two races. He'll be favored then for a third in a row, six to five on the morning line. You can get him at nearly seven to five, plus 135 to be exact at Circa in Las Vegas as we recorded Tuesday morning. Ed, we'll start with you with Epicenter. I'm, I'm surprised that he's taking this much money. Uh, certainly not surprised he's the favorite in the race. Uh, you know, I've, Kind of thought there was a chance a week ago he might be three to one that was completely wrong uh, and then i thought well two to one also completely wrong i mean he was trading less than three to two uh a few days ago even let alone with the the draw that certainly you know did him no harm so it's really tough what what to make of what to do with him because i agree he is the most likely winner I think six to five is a terrible price I do not think he wins this race five out of 11 times I don't think he wins this race four out of 11 times let alone five so it's it's a tough wagering proposition thankfully with a horse like Happy Jack and with a horse we haven't gotten to yet maybe there's an opportunity that if Epicenter is as good as everyone else thinks he is I can still do something in the race but I have absolutely zero interest in using this horse with early voting or secret oath. Uh, I think there's a potential, they're all underlays. Uh, so then it just becomes a matter of, you know, what can you do in the, the super factor or even the super high five with the nine horse field? He's the one to beat, uh, but as a Ragazin devotee, I am a little concerned. He took a step back in the Derby and now he's back on two weeks rest. Uh, that was a slow derby by their measurement. A little faster on Bristnet, so that gives some hope. But at six to five, I have to only use defensively with the long shots I like underneath. Interesting point to be made about what the sheets say. Mark, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I thought, well, first of all, I mean, it's a good point about the price. I think, you know, the way the public is thinking about it is, he, this was a horse who was a winner, at, you know, at the top of the stretch, he put away Zandon and then the fluky horse beat him. Uh, so I think that's where a lot of that uh, sentiment is coming from. Um, you know, that being said, there's just not a lot in here to beat him. You know, I don't see anything else besides secret oath or early voting to really contend. Um, I, I, I do think the Derby is going to help give him additional conditioning. He's, you know, he could even improve off that race. Um, I, I do think he probably wins this race 50% of the time, probably mostly because, you know, where do you find the other winners from? Mm. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think he's a, he's a strong play on top and, you know, I'm going to use, I'm going to look for the value underneath and not worry about, uh, I, I don't think it's some kind of huge overlay that if he's even money or six to five, but uh, I'll, I'll be glad to use it and then look for the value elsewhere. Okay, interesting uh, difference of opinion on how to use Epicenter, if to use Epicenter. Sarah, you want to break the tie? Yeah, what Ed's saying from a wagering standpoint that you don't want to see six to five and that if he thinks that this horse should be six to five and doesn't win however many percent of the time, then to, to toss. But I think if you just look at the horse without the price, he should be the favorite. He is the most likely winner of this race. And I do think that the Kentucky Derby was probably his best race. He had every reason to say this pace was too fast for me. I was sitting too close to it. I don't and just gave up at the top of the stretch. But he he was the closest to that pace of anybody else that finished in the super. 
And he, he drew off at the top of the stretch. He looked like a winner going through the entire length of the stretch. He did not let Zandon by whatsoever. He really dug into battle with that horse after sitting that close to the pace that completely collapsed. And then Rich Strike comes up the rail and surprises them both. But from a tactical standpoint, he has everything going his own way coming into this from a post position standpoint, he gets to sit outside of the other speed and decide where he wants to be early on. Joel Rosario will make the right move into when to go with him. And you're looking at a horse that I think is the best horse in the race. So I think something would have to go wrong or someone else would have to really step up and get a really great trip in order to beat him in here. All right, Ed, let me not put words in your mouth. Then. Am I characterizing you right that you 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 want to play him underneath but are reluctant to play him on top i mean would if you're spreading on horizontal are you including him uh i haven't looked enough at uh the preceding races to know if i like prices where i would use him in that case if it looks chalky ahead of him uh then i i would not use him in the preakness uh as far as the preakness betting goes uh it, it would be him with long shots only. I, I'm just not gonna play tickets that are epicenter with secret oath or epicenter with early voting. I'm gonna need some price in second. But like Sarah said and, and Mark, he is the most likely winner. I totally get that. Uh, so it, it's just that balance is a better, uh, you know, how you use him when you think he should be two to one. So he's still winning a third of the races, even in my, my scenario, but you're getting six to five. Hopefully the horse we get to next is the one that could make me look smart. This is why he's the king of ROI. You know that. He's the king of R he's Ray Wa. I'm I'm Think the king him. of telling you my bad ROI, but we're all we all seek transparency in this game. I like it. We wrap up the Preakness field with number nine, Skippy Longstocking by Exaggerator, the winner of the 2016 Preakness. Trained by Safi Joseph Jr., whose Colt White Abario finished 16th in the Derby. Junior Alvarado has the ride. This is a horse who's usually a stalker, was mid-pack finishing third in the Wood Memorial to Mo Donegal and early voting. His only two wins were in his maiden breaker by 10 on his third try in September and in an allowance race in March. Both were at Gulfstream Park, kind of the story with Safi. The success tends to be at Gulfstream, elsewhere the question mark. Bullet worked last Friday at Palm Meadows, 59 and three, going five furlongs before being the first to ship to Pimlico. Skippy Longstocking is 20 to one on the morning line. You can get him at 25 to one at Circa in Las Vegas. Mark? Yeah, um, I thought this horse ran a pretty nice race in the wood. In fact, Ron, I had a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're closer to this on the new side. This horse has been uh, going to the Preakness for a long time, right? Yeah, he was he was first in the gate or first in the uh, I think he got there. What was it Monday of last week or something like that? He got but there we, but, in a hurry. But we've had him listed on Horse Racing Nation on Sticks oh, as a, Tracker as a as probable forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been targeting this for a long, long time. Yeah, so I thought I thought that was interesting. <laughs> and what made me think think about that? I was just as I was handicapped in this race um, that uh, Safi was really quick to say that White Abario was not coming here. And, uh, and, and maybe this is the reason, uh, you know, I, I thought this horse ran a decent race in the wood. Uh, Safi did have two in there because he had AP secret as well. Um, and then this is the one that, uh, you know, he's going forward with. And uh, I, you know, I think he could get overlooked. I mean, he's in the nine hole 20 to one morning line. You get, may get higher than that. Um, and for me, this is the other super effective key. So I'm going to key the six and the nine and, uh, this horse could finish easily finish fourth, uh, could finish third, uh, you know, maybe use for a little bit higher, but, uh, this is how you get value. And, you know, the, I would say to Ed, you know, I, I hear you that if epicenter wins and early voting or secret oath runs second, um, it's hard to find value, but it's not impossible. And this is how you find the value. If you, if you smash, if you love Skippy log stocking and you smash epicenter over two horses, over the nine in a $10 straight trifecta or $10 wheel with two horses, that's going to still pay, especially, and then especially if you back that into the superfecta. So I'm just kind of trying to deal with the hand that we're dealt and uh, the hand that we're dealt looks pretty chalky on the top, but I think that the bottom is where we get the value. 
Uh, in the interest of what Ed was calling for, and that's transparency, I had my S's mixed up. Simplification was actually first to Pimlico among the Preakness horses. Skippy okay. Longstocking had that workout this past Friday at Palm Meadows, so no, he wasn't shuttling back and forth just to do a workout run. Sarah? Yeah, I don't like this horse at all. I get why people are looking for, Ed's face is great. Um, I get why people are looking for value underneath and he's a great price if you like him. I don't really think that he really did much running in the wood. I think he kind of just tagged along for third behind Mo Donegal in early voting. Two horses that were well clear of him uh, going into there. And I don't really think the rest of that field was any any superstars in there or anything like that. He's had a decent amount of starts at nine. He has tactical speed that he's shown before. They've been pointing for this race. There are things to like, and it would be silly of me to ignore them, but I just don't see it. I don't see him as a top three contender. I guess you could make some argument that he's in the top four out of everybody else in here, but I just don't think he's good enough. Ed, making faces, what do you want to say? Got something to say, Ed? I like the horse and, you know, maybe part of this is still looking wounds from uh, the Kentucky Derby in which the 80 to one winner came out of the same race that my pick in the Derby came out of and that I had spent the last two weeks saying what a key race it was. Uh, the Wood Memorial, I am not quite as bullish on, but the fact remains uh, that the Wood was the fastest race uh, by most figure makers measurements among the Derby prep, maybe the Santa Anita Derby, uh, depending on where Taba ranked, but certainly the wood was, was among the top two. And that was clear. Uh, it was the rest were, were well behind those. So uh, I kind of poke fun at the number admittedly at first, like, are you really telling me Skippy Longstocking got a 107? Ragazin gave him a seven which is three points faster than the Derby winner got. Uh, but at 20 to one, I'm willing to say, okay, I put all this time into using this information. If I'm not going to believe it at 20 to one, then what's the point? So you got to dance with who you came to the dance with. So to me, Skippy Longstocking is absolutely the key to this race. And, and Mark's right. Uh, you know, I, I kind of was a little hasty with, I don't want to have it if it's epicenter secret oath. If Skippy Longstocking's third, like that's I'm planting my flag that he's the long shot. That if he's in the mix, mm. I should do okay. So thank you, Mark, for uh, guiding me on the right path of how to use a price. And I'm really encouraged, Ron. I think of all the odds we've talked about from Cirque, this one's actually higher than the morning right. line, and maybe epicenter seven to five instead of six to five. But I mean, even Fenwick's lower, and he should be a thousand to one. So. I hope people ignore this horse, and I think he can just kind of run around the track and be third. Uh, I want to go back just for a second at the risk of going into a tangent here with the, the speed numbers coming out of the preps. The Louisiana Derby wasn't faster than the Wood, and I get that, you know, they don't run a mile and three sixteenths much at the fairgrounds, but it was a track record. And you look what Epicenter did, I, that was that's where my skepticism would come. Yeah, I think... Uh... And it was fast. I mean, a lot of people that use those numbers did pick up a center and he had the six weeks off. But I mean, the wood was just blistering 111 for the winner, early voting right there. And then Skippy Longstocking in third. Mo Donegal, uh, you know, I'd be interested, in, you know, what Mark and Sarah think, whether he held up that number or not in the Derby he was wide. He did run a little bit. So some encouragement. Not much, admittedly. Uh, so it, it's a pig and a poke. But again, at 20, 25 to one, uh, I, I do think he's the one. If, if you told me I had to, you know, pick from the non big three, I'm absolutely taking Skippy Longstocking. Mark, Sarah? I, I mean, I think he's, he's total value if he goes up to, you know, 25, 28, 30 to one. He's absolute value, uh, must use. There's a lot of things in his favor, including, you know, running th a competitive. I mean, I agree with Sarah that, uh, you know, he kind of came on for third there, but uh, there was some good, there were some other good horses behind him in the wood. It was a pretty good prep overall. His figures are good. There's just too many things to like for a 25 to one shot in a seven horse field. Okay. Any final word on that, Sarah? Sarah, I think you're muted for whatever reason. 
there we go. There you go. I, I think that, there, like I said, there's plenty of reasons to like him, but I think you have to take your stance on who you want to use as the long shot. And for me, that's Happy Jack more so than him. And I... I get it, but I just don't really think that he has a shot in here. I think that he can prove me wrong if he wants to in this race. But uh, caliber wise, I think there's at least four or five other horses that are just better than he is. So no, thank you. We will find out how this is all distilled into best ways to play the Preakness from each of our experts. That's coming up. First, let me tell you past performance is heard on the Ron Flatter Racing Pod are provided by Brisnet, the only place where you can find Kieran's speed points, the easy way to map the pace in any race. Find out more for yourself at brisnet.com. A reminder that the regular episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod posts Friday per usual. It will feature connections on the backside when we get to Pimlico in Baltimore this week. Surprises aplenty because I don't even know yet. Also, two-time Eclipse Award winning writer John Scheinman First racing analyst Naomi Tucker and the super screener himself, our own Mike Shuddy, with some hints about where to find value in the Preakness. And I think we've underscored why you might want to listen to him after what happened two weeks ago. All ahead on the regular Friday episode of the RFRP. And if you've been listening to this episode, you can watch us in video form on YouTube. The hardcore handicappers can be seen and heard this episode available starting Thursday if you're listening beforehand before the Preakness on the Horse Racing Nation page on YouTube. We had like 15,000 hits on the uh, Hardcore Handicappers edition for the Derby. So look forward to the pleasure of your company going forward as we are today. Best Preakness play time. Let me throw a couple of factoids at you. I know Ed loves these. The Preakness has been run after the Kentucky Derby every year since 1932. Of those 90 winners, 75 came out of the Derby, 83%. will epicenter simplification or happy jack joined that crowd this year in the last five runnings of the preakness though three winners were new shooters it's the greatest run of success for non-derby horses in the race since they won three of four between 1980 and 1983 since 1932 a new shooter has finished in the money 64 percent of the time okay so do you use it do you just throw it over your shoulder through the window and make it crash like david letterman Sarah, I'll ask you first. Sarah Albad, we find her on social media at Outrun the Odds. What's your top play and how to play? Preakness 147. Uh, in here, I'd probably go with a trifecta that would only use Epicenter on top. Maybe do <laughs> Secret Oath in second with, let's say, maybe early voting. Maybe you want to take them out for some more value underneath. And then in third, I would say maybe creative minister in there, a little happy Jack, um, leave in secret oath as well. Uh, with early voting, I think you either show, you see him show up or you see him kind of fade and be nowhere. I don't really think there might be an in-between for him. And then in fourth, I would include happy Jack, creative minister, secret oath, maybe a little simplification as well. The man who is found on Twitter, at EJXD2, and he has Happy Jack with Armagnac for his breakfast every morning. And when he will talk to you about Fenwick, he will remind you, of course, that Nell Fenwick, the uh, daughter of the inspector, used to date Dudley Do Right. Here's Ed DeRosa. I love reminding people of that it's a big hit at parties. Uh, you mentioned the Karen speed points, early voting, the only one with eight. Uh, the rest of the field has five or less. Uh, that is absolutely an advantage and one that. I plan on pushing uh, when it comes to wagering on the race. Uh, I do think uh, he'll, you know, be my key mostly to upset Epicenter and Secret Oath, mild upset as it is with Skippy Longstocking uh, being sort of the, the main key underneath for me. So how I play it in those situations, kind of the either or uh, early voting, I would bet to win at four to one or better. Uh, but Skippy Longstocking, definitely more the vertical key. And, you know, as I acquiesce to Mark, I, I think he's spot on. Uh, if it's epicenter, early voting, and Skippy is third, uh, you know, I, I sort of need to have that. So uh, to me, the, the big three are the only three that are legitimate threats to win. Uh, I think between the three of them, they win 75% of the time. It might even be a little bit more once I do the math. Uh, so that that's kind of where I want to zero in on and then have Skippy be in the mix with them. So 
Uh, lots of nines underneath is going to be my strategy on Saturday. For YouTube viewers, do you want to explain your shirt? My shirt, yeah, it's a little brown jug. I uh, got it in 1998 as a gift from my grandfather, uh, who passed away about eight months after that. So it was a uh, quick turnaround into my closet. It's the oldest piece of clothing that I own, or at least that I still wear, but uh, reminds me of him and uh, lets me be true to my harness roots every now and again. Okay. I saw my 1984 Olympic uniform from when I was doing public address for team handball from the wow. movie who cares yeah uh all right they Mark you wear Midland. a uniform yeah we had to wear uniforms oh god they, they, they were garish it, it looked like the 80s and it was all polyester so uh and i couldn't fit into it if i tried all right mark midland you have replaced the um screenshot behind you you were going to get run over by preakness horses now you're going to get run over by your picks so here you go mark midland and with how to and play i to put him on i put him as a background but i i'm seeing is the background uh flipped backwards no, no, it's no, it's only on your screen because they want, you know, so if you have to rub your eye, you rub the correct eye. That's so you can read it. Okay, well, then, then that's even better. So the let me I'll kind of move off screen. But the reason I wanted to illustrate this is a lot of times when people play superfectas or, you know, trifectas, they want to box them. Mm -hmm. or they want to play top down and just kind of add and add and add. And so Guilty. the challenge in this race is how do you find value? And so I'm gonna kind of move off screen a little here, but mm -hmm. the value is in keying the six and the nine. And so if you key the six and nine and fourth, you're basically buying superfectas that are guaranteed to have a 30 to one shot hit the board or hit your ticket. None of these tickets will pay peanuts. So you're basically buying value tickets every time. And so as I was saying is really with tossing, uh, Fenwick tossing Armagnac. It's a seven horse field. I'm not, I, I do think there's a chance that creative minister doesn't run well. That's six horses. If you take the six and nine, you've got two of them between the two of them. They only have to beat one horse to finish fourth. And I think what people sometimes miss on the probability of superfectas is, is a horse that's 30 to one to win. Let's assume that those odds are correct to win. They're not 30 to one to run. <laughs> fourth. They're actually at both closers. Happy Jack and uh, Skippy. And so they've got a huge shot to run at the end uh, and hit, uh, you know, hit, hit fourth. Now, uh, depending on how deep you want to go, and that's why I listed uh, four different wagers, but uh, my real kind of strong play would be the first two to uh, really press uh, the top choices. Pressing those top choices in first and second. And again, I'll move off, but if you limit to the, uh, epicenter in first or the four and eight in first um and then the four five eight and second you're talking about uh the second one there is a 12 dollar super and you can smash it if you're a real epicenter fan you think you can win go with four five and second for 12 dollars. you can hit repeat on that several times depending on bankroll and the bottom two for me are probably a little bit more of a backup maybe have those once uh i do think that happy jack and uh and some of the others aren't impossible uh, to run second. So that's when Superfecta smash the first couple with uh, uh, Secret Oath and Epicenter on top, keep it tight in second. And uh, you can also move the six nine into uh, the third spot and flip it uh, to kind of cover that as one, once. But uh, between the two of them, I think there's a good shot. And if uh, they both run third and fourth, there's your value because if it goes Epicenter, over one of the top two and you get, you know, these two coming up at 20, 30 to one, you're going to have a real nice superfecta. Okay. I'm going to recite this. If you're in your car and you're not watching YouTube, okay. and by the way, if you're driving, don't be watching YouTube, but do start the engine. I always advise that. Okay. So your, uh, your first play on the uh, dollar super is the four and eight over the four, five, eight over the one, four, five, six, eight, nine, over the six nine so that's a two by three by six by two 24 dollars the second one dollar superfecta play the eight cold on top over the four five over the one four five six eight nine over the six nine twelve dollars for the one by two by six by two the third play four eight keyed on top over the one four five six eight nine Again, over the one, four, five, six, eight, nine, over the six, nine. So that's two by six by six by two, 
$48. And the final, eight cold on top over 145689, and again over 145689, over 69. So that's one by six by six by two, $24. Easy rewind if you want. If you're on YouTube, you've already got this written down and you're already gone to the window to or your ADW to go ahead and fill this out. Nicely done, Mark. You were prepared for this. We'll see if, it, if it hits. If it's a winner, it's nicely done, right? And then we get that lunch. We get that big, you know, we get that uh, that caviar pizza that we've been talking about. I don't know that this is pizza. Yeah, it's not pizza, but you can turn turn it into something. The other thing too, I should just say too, is you can improvise uh if you want to play the super high five and uh, the six nine key them in fifth and uh you know especially again if you're keeping it tight on top I, I didn't do the math but i don't think that's going to come out all that expensive no it's uh, no it looks it it looks enticing i, I certainly it looks enticing uh i'm maybe only a slice not slice of pizza ed uh, yeah what, be, what about it ed maybe a slice of pizza not a whole pizza yeah a slice especially at the place we have next door oh yeah <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I won't mention names. Uh, I've, I'm going to get, I got shown up actually. I, I'm thinking there's not a lot of money to be made here. Epicenter looking too good to me. Secret Oath proved her worth at Oaklawn and the tap at Bloodlines have me bullish on Creative Minister. Uh, but I'm going to listen again to what Mark and Ed have said about long shots and what Sarah says, because Sarah's always cashing these multi-race tickets. So I'll go with Epicenter on top over Secret Oath and Creative Minister for the time being. My thanks again to Sarah Albadwi, Ed DeRosa, and Mark Midland. They will be back in three weeks for the Belmont Stakes pop-up. Don't forget Friday, our regular episode comes from Baltimore with Preakness Connections, plus John Scheinman, Naomi Tucker, and Mike Shuddy. Until then, this is Ron Flatter with this notice from the Overnights at Pimlico. Trainers, you must hang your in-today signs on your horse's stall door on race day. A failure to do so may result in a scratch and a fine.